All right, so if you brought your Bibles, find the book of Romans, find chapter 6, Romans chapter 6. And as you turn there, let me just say how excited I am, not only for your attendance, but I am excited about baptisms today. Uh, one of the um, uh, members of our Oklahoma Baptist said to me specifically, not many of our churches are baptizing right now. And so we are in the minority in the good way on that. And so we will continue to, as safety allows us, continue to move forward with the two ordinances of the church. We're going to baptize today and very shortly, again, when things are, are safe and our church is coming back in, um, in full force in terms of numbers, we're going to have the Lord's Supper, which we also have push back far too long so and we'll do that in a very safe manner as well well that being said I want to throw a little bit of a curveball I know we started a little series on the cross last week and we'll, we will re return Lord willing to uh, Peter 318 and we'll look at that wonderful verse that deals with different aspects of the cross last week uh, we looked at an aspect of the cross that was uh, tremendously important for us as believers, uh, the doctrine of substitution. Jesus died in our stead. Well, knowing that this uh, baptism was coming today and um, really being excited about it, having heard Romans 6 taught very recently in our Sunday school class, Romans 6 has been on my heart, and so I thought I would uh, do a little time out to our mini-series, and we would go to Romans 6 today, and I would talk to you about baptism today. Now that sounds pretty boring, doesn't it? But I want you to know it's one of the sweetest doctrines in all of the Word of God, the fact that we are baptized uh, into Christ and the ramifications of that. And so find the book of Romans, find chapter 6. Now, when you're looking at Romans chapter 6, let me just say, Paul has already said a lot. Romans is the Mount Everest of, of Bible books. And so you're not going to find a better book that explains the gospel uh, than Romans, okay? In fact, if I was placed on a desert island and told you're going to live the rest of your life on this desert island and burn, you can pick one book, I want you to know, honestly, uh, Romans would probably be that one book because it's all that a Christian needs to know about Jesus and salvation. Now, not all, but it certainly encapsulates um, everything that we need to know to be victorious in the Christian life. And so we're looking at Romans chapter 6. Now, when Paul starts Romans chapter 6, he has already said quite a bit. Namely this, we're all sinners, Jews and Gentiles. We all deserve judgment. And then he says, salvation is by grace through faith alone. He talks about the doctrine of justification by faith. And so he says we're all saved, not by works, not by uh, keeping the Ten Commandments or following the words of Jesus or being a moral person, uh, we're saved by grace through faith. In other words, every single person, both Jew and Gentile, nobody has a leg up on this thing, both Jew and Gentile, you come to God empty-handed. You don't come to God like a peacock strutting your stuff or like a racehorse in all of your glory. Uh, you come to God empty-handed as a beggar and you simply receive Jesus Christ uh, by faith. And Paul labors the fact to let everybody know faith, trusting in Christ, receiving Jesus Christ, is not a work. You don't earn salvation by having faith. God does all the saving. You simply receive salvation. Luther, back in the 16th century, and Calvin used a lot of metaphors for faith. And um, one of them described it as a clasp on a ring that holds a diamond or a ruby or some jewel. And so that's basically what faith is. You simply receive, you hold, you uh, accept Jesus Christ by grace through faith. And so he does all the saving. We do nothing except bring our sin to salvation, and he does the rest. And so knowing that, that salvation is by grace through faith, Paul is anticipating as he talks about how great the grace of God is in a believer's life. Where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. In fact, I like the idea of the Holy Spirit having a flag thrown on him because um, it, for, for piling on. There's sin, but he piles on grace. And grace always, always overcomes sin. And, um, and so knowing that Paul has what's called an interlocutor. It's a big word. Uh, but it means 
when you're writing or you're making an argument, sometimes you will project what your enemy or what somebody might say in terms of a defense. And then you will, um, at that point, as you've got the, the interlocutor is the person that you dialogue with in your mind and in your heart. And then you respond to that interlocutor. Does that make sense? And so in, in, in Romans chapter 6, and he's already started this um, in terms of just thinking about what the Jews might say and responding to that. The interlocutor in Romans chapter 6 is thinking this, okay? And Paul is going to respond to this. Okay, Paul, if I'm saved by grace through faith, I don't do anything to earn it. I don't do anything to keep it. And my sin um, uh, is always overcome and always highlighted, over-highlighted by God's grace. Okay, if I'm eternally secure, a good Baptist interlocutor might say, okay, you believe in the doctrine of once saved, always saved, and I can't do anything to lose it. Therefore, I'll tell you what, I'll just go out and sin. I'll just keep sinning uh, because God's grace always overcomes and supersedes my sin. And in fact, the interlocutor is thinking in his mind and heart. Not only that, the more I sin, the more God gives grace. And the more God gives grace, the more he is glorified. And so again, my sin is okay. I'll just keep sinning. <laughs> I know I made a profession of faith. I know I was baptized. And um, I'm just going to keep sinning. And so um, you might say, now, Brother Burns, certainly people don't think like that today, do they? I can understand them thinking like that in the first century after they've heard the book of Romans, uh, one chapters 1 through 5. But certainly they don't think like that today. Yes, they do. Unfortunately, you meet a lot of people when you talk to them thinking that I made a profession of faith, maybe when I was a child, or I was baptized, or I joined a church, or I prayed a prayer, or I cried some crocodile tears when I was at camp when I was 13 years old or whatever it might be. And um, since that time in my life, I've not served Jesus. In fact, um, when you look at the list of sins in the flesh uh, found in the book of Galatians or maybe that litany found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, even though I'm guilty of living a patterned lifestyle of sin, I truly believe that once saved, always saved, I'm going to heaven. And it's been years and years and years since I've done anything spiritual. There's absolutely no spiritual fruit in my life, technically speaking. And yet, because I prayed a prayer back when I was a kid, or because I walked an aisle, or because I shook the preacher's hand, or maybe as a baby I was baptized or whatever, I, now I can kind of live any life that I want. The idea for a lot of people is, man, as long as I uh, pray the prayer, sign the card, be baptized, join the church, whatever. As long as I jump through the hoop, then what God gives me is fire insurance and the rest of uh, my life really doesn't matter. And so I can live any way that I want, even um, contrary to God's word. Well, anybody that knows the Bible knows that uh, not only does that contradict Paul's writings, it contradicts James' writings, it contradicts the words of Jesus and, and literally um, the whole testimony of the Word of God. The Bible says that when we are saved, it is a one-time event. We're justified, declared, we're declared righteous by God. God does a work of regeneration in our lives. We are made alive. And it is true that we can't lose our salvation. We are eternally, eternally secure. You cannot lose your salvation. What God began... Uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 he will perform even into our even into the day of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ what he started he will finish he will bring you into glory Paul goes on to talk about that in Romans chapter 8 those whom he called he justified those whom he justified he glorified past tense it's a done deal in the mind and heart of God so we have what was talked about today in Sunday school the eternal security of the believer hallelujah thank God for that uh, but even though all of that is true, Paul and the rest of the apostles say that faith saves alone, but that faith that saves will never be alone. And just listen to me. A faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. <laughs> Let me say that again. I said a faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. And if you've got a person, regardless of whether they've made a profession of faith or not, that doesn't display fruit, that doesn't display some type of evidence 
of their walk with Jesus, then what you have is you have a person that probably, most likely, and most certainly, at least in my mind, has never been born again from above. And you can have a, a professor, somebody that professes faith, that isn't a possessor. And the Bible is very clear. Examine yourself and see whether you be in the faith. Paul says that in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Chapter 13. Uh, he says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. You've got to look at your life and you've got to say, okay, I know that I made a profession of faith at some point in my life. And you might be able to look back on a baptism or earmark the time in your life when God did a great work. But the question is, is am I displaying a lifestyle or a pattern, not a perfection? None of us will uh, uh, display a pattern of perfection. Only Jesus Christ does that. But there is, there is at least in a true believer's life a, a moving ahead, a progress towards righteousness and towards holiness and towards godliness. And so the Bible says we're to examine ourselves. The Bible says that, that we are to look at the evidences of our salvation uh, and so do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, is there a true affinity in your heart for Jesus? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you loathe sin? In other words, when you sin, are you convicted for it? When you sin, are you upset about the fact that you've sinned against God and you've broken His holy commandment? Do you love Jesus? Do you loathe sin? And then, do you love the fellowship of the saints? Okay? And so saved people actually love to be around saved people. Saved people love to worship. They love corporate worship. They love the body of Christ. Doesn't mean you have to like them. <laughs> A lot of us are so unlovable. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we love worship and we love to be around God's people. And those are evidences. That's in your DNA. When somebody saved, when I got saved, let me tell you something. You didn't have to give me a Sunday school class on loving Jesus, loathing sin, and loving the body of Christ. I just, I just automatically, because I was born again, I had an affinity for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not only that, when I would sin, and when I continue to sin, even today, when I sin, the Holy Spirit of God takes me to the divine woodshed. I feel convicted for my sin. And, and um, I've got to get things right because I want to be right with my Lord. And any time in my life that I've begun to live in a pattern of sinfulness, the Holy Spirit of God has always been there to bring me back to the Lord and stop that pattern of sin. And it starts in the mind. You sow an action, or you sow a, a thought, rather. You reap an action. Sow an action. You reap a habit. Sow a habit. You'll reap a character. Sow a character, character, you will reap a destiny. And so when you are living in, in unbridled, ungodly sin for a patterned time, it's just a pattern of your life without the Holy Spirit of God convicting you, drawing you to Himself, um, uh, dealing with you, taking you to the divine woodshed, as I call it, like he did with Israel, uh, like God did with all of his churches that were genuinely saved, whom the Lord loves, he chast chastises, the Bible says. And so if you have that in your life, you know that you're a true believer. But if you can continue in a pattern of unbridled sin, then you need to ask yourself, do I truly know Jesus? Those that truly know him, love him. And those that truly know him, loathe sin. Or never comfortable in a pattern of sin and so we keep short accounts with God number three you love the fellowship of the saints and so you love God's people and there's just something about uh, gathering with God's people and you just you can't be kept back from going to church and from serving God like that now don't misunderstand me okay I'm not saying that um, if you don't go to church or you've got some problems with the body of Christ that you're lost that's not what I'm saying but what I am saying is generally the evidence of being a born-again believer is a love for the saints. We love one another because this is the place where the two ordinances of the church are not only uh, carried out and employed, but also we love to uh, gather together in corporate worship. And so those are evidences. And so uh, Paul is writing. It's a big porch. Relax. It's a little room, okay? But uh, uh, Paul is writing to that interlocutor that is thinking, okay, I'm eternally secure. 
God's grace overcomes and always trumps sin. So therefore, I'll continue to sin. I'll just live my life any way that I want. And at the end, God will save me and everything's good. In fact, even while I sin, I'm kind of glorifying God because God's showing more grace. And so Paul is writing that guy. He's writing us. He's writing the 21st century so-called Christian that has made a profession of faith and yet there's no evidence, ongoing evidence in their lives. And Paul is answering that interlocutor and he says this in chapter 6, verse 1. Look at it with me. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Paul is anticipating the question. What shall we say then? Are we to continue what? In sin so that grace may increase. Then he uses the strongest language he can in the Greek New Testament. Moi geneo. May it never be. My King James Version says there, God forbid. Heck no. Well, is what Paul is saying. Uh, may it never be. How shall, then he asks a question to the interlocutor. How shall we, we that are born again, we that are saved, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And then Paul says in verse 3, do you not know? Let me ask you something. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, he says, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, Paul says, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, there's that knowing word again, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. Verse 11, here's the application for the interlocutor and for us. Even so... I want to say this to these three teenagers. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Whew. Ladies and gentlemen, that's good. That's good. Glory to God. You know, when I, I was saved, I was saved in a Pentecostal church. Some of you are sitting there going, oh, that explains it. <laughs> and, uh, but when I was saved, I was saved in a Pentecostal church. And um, uh, the church that I was saved in emphasized spirit baptism. They talked a lot about the gifts of the Spirit and um, being filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, but one of the things that they, didn't, uh, that they didn't emphasize, even though they emphasized the, what they called the baptism of the Spirit, they did not emphasize water baptism. So my first six months as I uh, served the Lord in that church, my first six months, even as I walked with the Lord as a new believer, I was never told, uh, never taught, hey, you gave your life to Christ, you were born again, so therefore your next step, the first step of obedience, by the way, is water baptism. I was never taught that. And so, by the grace of God, I did a little church hopping there. I, uh, By the way, you don't know this probably, but my first year of my Christian life, I backslid quite a bit. I struggled. I really did. And when I talk about backsliding, um, particularly after the first six months, um, I went back to the alcohol. I went back to the drugs. I went back to the partying there on the west side of Tulsa. And uh, those were times that God would give me a divine spanking and get me back to himself, you know. And I could tell you stories about where God allowed those things to happen in my life because the way of the transgressor is hard, the Bible says. And God used that to draw me back. And God does that in a believer's life. I'm not going to be able to continue my life in sin. I'm God's now. As a young believer, I was learning that. I was learning that I was God's. And, and I was struggling with coming out of Egypt. It isn't that uh, salvation 
is immediate glorification or immediate sanctification when you're saved. God does a great work on the inside of you, but that begins the process. You can't clean a fish until it's caught. And so God catches you, and then God begins to clean you up. And so my first year was a struggle. Uh, I struggled a lot. And some of you are sitting there going, thank you, Brother Vern. Thank you for letting me know that I'm not abnormal. Uh, I struggle. I still struggle. And by the way, I'm, I don't want to come off to you that after that first year, I quit. Str- I've always struggled against sin. We all do, right? That's the normal pattern of the Christian life. And so it's kind of good for young believers to be reminded, particularly those that struggle a little bit, that, hey, that's perfectly normal. That's, that's, that we all are fighting against sin. But it's also good to be reminded, even as more mature believers, that this is a struggle. And, and, and so I struggled, particularly that first year. Um, and so anyway, through the grace of God, I found a little church where there was some expository preaching being done, where Leslie Clark opened up the Bible, and he preached there at Bowen Baptist Church in what I'll call North Tulsa. And he preached salvation by grace through faith, and he preached the Bible Verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And I knew I was sitting under a type of preaching that was not only biblical, but a type of preaching that fed my soul. And so uh, I was in that little church. I began to be discipled even from the pulpit. All of a sudden, they say, we're going to Indian Falls Creek. It's an Indian church. They're going to Indian Falls Creek, which is a family camp. And even though I was 19 years of age at the time, uh, I necessarily, I didn't necessarily want to go. They said there'd be girls there, and I said, "Sign me up, <laughs> I'll go." I felt led of the Lord to go. Okay, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, I went to Falls Creek and met Jennifer at Falls Creek, who would become my bride. Okay, now when I got back to Tulsa, she lived in Tahlequah. I was getting in my little Ford Escort with 14-inch tires. And that's funny because I had 15-inch subs in the back, okay? I was just saved. Remember that. So 15-inch subs in the back, 14-inch tires, and I was blazing a trail down the turnpike to Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And so I walked into New Greenleaf Baptist Church. I began to attend there, talked to the pastor, walked forward. Hey, pastor, God's called me to preach. said, okay, uh, we can help you with that. I also want to join the church. Okay, we can help, help you with that. Let me ask you a question, Brother Vern. Have you ever been baptized? Well, listen, that's a great question. I grew up moving around a lot. I, I like to tell people I was baptized so many times the crawdads knew my first name. Of course I've been baptized. Every red-blooded American has been to VBS and been baptized. Yes, I've been baptized a lot. Different kinds of denominations, different kinds of churches, different situations. I've been baptized. Um, but he said, no, have you been baptized since you believed? Now listen, this is an uneducated, in terms of a formal theological educated preacher, this is an uneducated preacher that knows the Bible and knows that first of all you're saved by grace through faith, and then following that you do what's called believer's baptism. It's scriptural to be born again first, Save first, and then to follow the Lord in what's called believer's baptism. So what he was really asking me is this. I'm not asking you if you've been saved. I've heard that confession. But I'm asking you if your baptism is on the right side of your salvation. And if it's not, you don't have believer's baptism, which is genuine biblical baptism. Now, you might be sitting there going, Now, Brother Burns, certainly... You know, you're just talking about mode here and it doesn't necessarily matter and that kind of thing. But I want you to know, it matters significantly. You have to have your baptism on the right right side of your salvation because of what baptism means. That's what Paul is arguing here in Romans chapter 6. Paul is saying that your baptism represents on the outside what took place in your heart. Right? Right? It's an outward declaration of something that happened on the inside of you. And if you declare that before that actually happened, your baptism has no true meaning. And so Paul is saying that when a person is saved, then a person is a candidate for baptism. And so the first thing that I want you to notice in this is the magnitude of baptism. Look down there at verse 3. He says, or do you not know that All of us, all of us, how many of the believers were baptized? 
All of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death. So that's the, that's the, the magnitude of baptism. It's for all of us. Believer's baptism on the right side of your salvation is for all of us. And so, um, baptism after conversion was such a common thing in the early church, Paul assumed it. Now, you know what happens in our churches generally, if you go to Falls Creek or something, youth camp, whatever it is, generally we're going to have some preachers stand down front and we'll invite people that want to receive Christ, we'll invite them to come forward, right? Right? And a um, person generally comes forward or maybe prays a prayer or raises their hand or signs a card or something. But generally, then we announce that person. We'll have that person stand. Somehow declare to the rest of the congregation, I've made a profession of faith. And that's a big deal, to make an open profession of faith. The Bible says, whosoever the Lord calls shall, shall not be ashamed. And so we're not ashamed of Christ when we are genuinely born again. Okay? Now, the early church, the way that they did their profession of faith was not by asking people to walk an aisle. There were no aisles in those early churches. They didn't even have buildings. They didn't ask people to sign a card or even to pray a prayer um, or somehow to make a profession of faith to stand up front and everybody passes by and gives you the right hand of fellowship. The early church, here's how they gave their invitations. You ready? You want to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? You want to become a follower of His? You want to be born again from above? Place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and declare it to the world by being baptized. Baptism was the way the early church confessed to the whole world. It was a public display to the whole world of what God did internally in the heart of each and every believer. Are you guys tracking with me today? All right. So, Paul says there's a magnitude here of baptism. All of us. And so there's a pattern in the book of Acts. Watch this. Ready? Acts chapter 8. Ethiopian eunuch saved, baptized. Acts chapter 9. Saul of Tarsus saved and baptized. Acts chapter 10. Cornelius the Gentile saved and then baptized with his house who also believed. I mean, it's, it's the pattern. You've got salvation and then you've got baptism. So that's the, that's the magnitude of baptism to the extent the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 goes like this. Go therefore into the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the declaration of Jesus to the church is you go into the world and the way that you make disciples is number one, by baptizing them. And so this is not a minor thing that we're doing today with these three teenagers. It's not a minor thing that we do as a church. It's a major thing as people confess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you've got the magnitude. You've also got the mode. Verse 3, the word baptism means to fully immerse. Okay? Baptizo, the Greek word, is what was used in the first century of a ship that sunk, fully immersed. It's the word that I use when I'm out there, Brother Doug, on the golf course for my golf ball. Uh, when I hit it into the water, put it in the drink, my uh, ball is baptized. It's baptizo. It's fully immersed. Uh, that's what the word means. And so the mode of baptism is full immersion. Jesus was fully immersed. We as Baptists follow the biblical pattern to the T. We don't believe uh, in, in um, pouring, what's called effusion. We don't be believe in a spri a sprinkling. Uh, we believe that we are to fully immerse. When I take these three teenagers here in just a little bit, this has already been explained to them uh, by their interim youth pastor. But I'm going to take them, and you're going to see me in the water. I'm standing in the water. I'm standing in what's called a watery grave, if you will. Uh, and I'm going to take them, and I'm going to put them under. You want to know what you do with a dead person? You bury them. Now, I've never done it except last year here, and that is broken the pattern, and here's the reason I broke the pattern, and that's because of the importance of the picture that's being depicted when somebody is baptized. You take somebody that has died to sin, and died to their old lifestyle, and you fully immerse them. Well, some of you might remember when I first got here, my big brother, who um, is not, a, not small in stature, wanted to be baptized. So, okay, I'll do that. 
Well, I got Big Bobby up there. First of all, the water in our baptistry is not very high, which makes it difficult, especially in terms of buoyance with a large person. That doesn't help. Uh, if that water was up here, it would have been easy to baptize them. You know, uh, uh, trying to source Rex could have baptized them. You know, but we, uh, no. Uh, I got this big boy standing there, uh, you know. And um, so anyway, I put him down. I lean over because he's so heavy because I'm trying to get a little bit of, you know, um, uh, momentum, a little bit of leverage. Big bird, I leaned over. I've got these suspenders on. You'll see them in just a moment. When I leaned over, all the water just went right down to my suspenders. And so my underwear, my socks, everything, wet. You know, I'm, you know. anyway, so I pushed him back up. And um, actually, it was this way, technically. Um, but. I looked and I remember when I did it, all of that is taking place. His forehead did not go under the water. And I've never done that. I've never not fully immersed somebody in all of my years of ministry. And so I'm standing there in a dilemma. I'm like, and I know that you probably didn't see it. I didn't know if he knew it or not, but I knew his forehead didn't go under water. And so I just thought, Am I going to break the pattern? I know that the picture is not perfect. I want the picture to be perfect because when we bury somebody, we don't bury them with their hands sticking out of the, out of the ground. We fully immerse them. I'm just trying to be biblical. So I said, Bobby, I'm going to do it again. You remember that? Let's do it again. All right? And uh, I put him down again. I brought him back up, and he said, you got me that time. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so never happened uh, before. I hope it never happens again. But there's a reason. There's a reason I wanted to fully immerse him, because that's what we do with somebody that's dead. Oh, my goodness. I don't have time today. <sighs> Let me tell you something. This is why you can't live the way you used to live. You're dead. This is why you can't continue to live the patterns that you used to live. You're dead, and when you were baptized, your baptism symbolized the fact that you died to that old way of life. And what Paul is saying is, is baptism is a picture of what God did in your heart, and so therefore shall we continue in sin that grace may abound of course not you've been baptized you've died to sin you're raised to walk in newness of life just like your savior friend i was a high school dropout i was in trouble with the authorities i was living an immoral life when a black preacher led me to jesus i wandered into new greenleaf baptist church and when i stood before that pastor and they baptized me in the illinois river there in tahlequah oklahoma i wasn't just declaring to my future bride, I wasn't just declaring to my future in-laws and, and, and my church. I was declaring to all of Tulsa West Side, all of my old friends, all of my family members. I was declaring to the whole world that Vern Charette, as he used to exist, as he used to sin and live a lifestyle running away from God and disobeying God, that Vern Charette now has been murdered with Christ on the cross. I'm united to Christ forever by faith faith and just as jesus was buried the old Vern charette was buried these three teenagers three teenagers are declaring the fact our old lifestyle is buried with christ and when i was brought up out of the water i was declaring to the whole world that i am raised to walk in newness of life shall we continue to live that old lifestyle anymore god forbid i'm raised to walk in newness of life that's your answer so what do you do? You consider that to be a fact in your life. Paul says in verse 11, consider that. It's, a, it's a, an accounting term. Reckon that to be so in your life. When sin knocks, a dead man can't open the door. The next time sin knocks, rather than get up in the flesh and open the door because only your carnal nature can open the door to sin, instead, the next time that sin knocks, you said, dead man is dead here and cannot open that door. Don't respond to it. And you can do that now as a child of God. Why? Your old man is dead. You don't have to live in a pattern of sin. And so you can have victory in Christ. And so consider it done. Cut things out of your life that are displeasing to God. Okay, consider and cut things out of your life that are displeasing to God. And then finally, consecrate yourself to God. Say, Lord, I'm raised to walk in newness of life. I'm going to live 
in a way that pleases you. Isn't that good? Hallelujah. Bow your heads with me, and I'll close. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer. If you've never received Christ, and you want to nail it down today, it just, for some reason, the gospel just... It, it clicked with you today. It happens sometimes like that. You can be in church your whole life. You can be religious. You can even have even made a profession of faith. And yet, at some point, it just clicks. And you realize, you know what? It, I understand I need to profess Christ and trust Him and Him alone for salvation. And I truly need to be saved and born again. I need the new birth in my life so that I can uh, change my lifestyle. And by the way, I am not saying you clean up and then you come to Christ. I'm saying you come to Christ the way that you are. I, I came to Christ as a sinner. The same way all of us come to Christ. You come to Christ as a sinner. You ask him to save you. And uh, God will begin that great work in you. Doesn't mean you're going to be made perfect immediately. But that just means you're inviting Christ to save you. You changed your mind about the direction of your life. That's called repentance. And he's going to start a new work in your life. But that's you. Pray a prayer right now. No one looking around. I'm not even going to ask you for an outward expression of it. Let's pray a prayer right there. Say, Father, um, I trust you. I need to be saved. I realize it. I might have been baptized. Might be a member of a church. Might be a good American that is moral. But, Father, I'm a sinful person. I admit it. I don't want to live my life in a displeasing way. Lord, I give you my life right now. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that he was buried and he was raised. Now, Lord, as I confess you as my Savior right now in my heart and trust you, Lord, help me to step into the waters of baptism in, in my near future and give my life to Christ. I've already given my life to Christ, but Lord, help me to declare that I've given my life to Christ to the whole world now. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. John's going to play a little bit. I really want you to, if he wants to lead you in some music, fine. Um, I really want you to meditate, however, as a believer on what you just heard. You need to cut some things. You need to consider some things. But you need to cons consecrate yourself. And so he's going to keep you for just a few minutes. I'm going to take these three teenagers over would love a male or a female I didn't ask him because I've been so busy but if somebody could help us Roy uh, on my side you guys come with us um, and uh, you guys will march over a little bit technically the service will be over but I hope that everybody stays around it's not going to last very long in there I particularly want you guys that are family members and friends to make sure you guys sit up close on those front rows um, you can stand if you'd like, socially distance, whatever you feel like in terms of safety. You do that. I don't even mind if the family wants to, you guys to come up and gather even up there on the, st on the pulpit area and stand there um, near the camera and that kind of thing. Whatever. We're just going to move over there. If you want to pick up your kids during this time and bring them in there, you may do that. Okay? Uh, but we're going to move over, over there, and we're going to get this bap these baptisms completed. Okay, love you. God bless you.